So I'm going to present you about my thesis uh, about motor imagery. Uh, but first, let me introduce myself. My name is Bretje de Wild, as Mark Smith said. Uh, and um, as a physiotherapist, I'm interested in motor learning, motor performance, neurology, and pediatric physiotherapy. Uh, so I like doing research about motor imagery, so I made the, deci the decision to start in September uh, the Master in Human Movement Science at the VU University in Amsterdam. Uh, but first let me tell you about motor imagery. So what is motor imagery about? Training a skill without physical activity. Uh, as you can see on the, the screen, um, uh, Brain activity during motor imagery is almost the same as during actual movement. So which parts of the brain are involved in motor imagery? Uh, it's quite a difficult uh, um, picture, but uh, the primary motor cortex, the supplementary motor area, the parietal cortex, uh, the basal ganglia, uh, the cerebe cerebellum, and a part of the brainstem are involved. Uh, and it's already used in neurorehabilitation and in top sports. Uh, but it could be a great way to train during an immobilization because patients can train well, where, well they are immobilized uh, without, physically, um, uh, without being physically active. Uh, so research shows that you can train uh, uh, rates of motion and strength during an immobilization with motor imagery. But maybe you can also train uh, an, a skill, a quite a difficult skill, such as throwing during the immobilization uh, of the wrist, for example. So, uh, based on that assumption, I formulate my research question. What is the effect of motor imagery on the throwing ability with the non-preferred hands, with the non-preferred arm, in healthy people? I try to answer this research question by doing an uh, randomized control trial. So uh, I want to tell you about which steps you have to take to create a good motor imagery intervention. Uh, first you have to know uh, which skill you want to train. Uh, I choose a quite difficult skill such as throwing. I need a little bit more coordination because of the uh, degrees of freedom of the arm. Um, and then you, you need to know do you want to train kinesthetic or do you want to train visual. Visual motor imagery is more about creating a, 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 a picture of yourself in your head. So visualize what you are doing. Uh, you can train vis visual motor imagery uh, for a more open skill, more open skill with an unpredictable environment, because you need more visual feedback. Uh, I choose for kinesthetic motor imagery. Kinesthetic motor imagery is more for a closed skill. It's more effective. Uh, because uh, the environment is more predictable. So, um, and kinesthetic motor imagery is about feeling what you are doing. I forgot to say that. Uh, then you need to uh, get clear instructions. Uh, so for a visual or a kinesthetic representation. And you need to know the training intensity. So uh, train not more than 20 minutes every time. And about for three times a week. Uh, my participants train two weeks, uh, so six motor imagery trainings. So uh, we measure the throwing ability uh, by uh, throwing on a target. Uh, we quantify it, it uh, by the points they earned, and uh, we measure the EMG signal uh, during uh, the throwing, before and after the intervention. Uh, so my results. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't find a significant result between the intervention group and the control group um, by the points they earned while well, uh, during the throwing. Um, but we did find a significant result on the onset of the uh, muscle uh, activity um, measured by the EMG. So a motor imagery intervention of two weeks seemed to have no effect on the throwing ability of the non-preferred arm in healthy people, uh, but we did uh, possibly affect uh, did find a possible effect on, at the onset of the muscle contraction. Because the muscle contraction before the intervention was much higher than the muscle contraction after the intervention at the onset of the uh, EMG signal. Um, and we did find a remarkable trend in all results. Uh, because uh, participants who scored the first time relative high uh, make more often progression than participants who scored the first time relative low. So, 
I want actually, I actually, I want to let you feel it yourself, the motor imagery. Uh, so try to create a very kinesthetic representation. Um, try to feel the movement in your head, but you're not allowed to move. So put your hands on the table in front of you. Also, if you're watching the video at home, and close your eyes. Yes, everybody eyes closed. Hold the tennis ball with your non-preferred hand. Feel very clearly the force in the muscle of your non-preferred hand in order to throw the 58 grams tennis ball. Throw the ball. Okay, you're able to open your eyes. So, I want to ask you a question. Who thought, uh, who was able to get a clear kinesthetic representation? You can put your hand in the air. Uh, I think five or six people, and most of you weren't able to get a kinesthetic representation, I think. No? So you actually confirm my first point of discussion. Uh, because Olsen et al said it, if you can't do it, you won't think it. I chose a very untrained skill for the non-preferred hand, such as throwing, with complex skill. Uh, and um, it, it, it seemed to be that uh, when a, a skill is too untrained and too complex, that you don't get a real uh, kinesthetic, clear representation in your head. So uh, you can't train it uh, by motor imagery then. Um, that could also be uh, uh, the reason why our participants who had the first time a relative high score uh, make more progression than the participants who had the first time a relative low score. Uh, so they were possibly more trained than the other participants. So my second point, uh, participants weren't immobilized in my study. Um, during an immobilization, the activity in the basal ganglia uh, stops. So the supplementary motor area, who is responsible for uh, the planning and the organization of a movement, uh, does get information from the ba basal ganglia. When this information stops, you get a reorganization process. So um, when you are stimulating the basal ganglia with motor imagery, you could, could stop the reorganization process. So that's why I think uh, when you immobilize some, uh, your participants that you could have an effect with motor imagery. But further research uh, have to make this point clear. My last point uh, is the practicability of motor imagery. Because my participants uh, said they have uh, troubles with staying concentrating during their uh, intervention. So, um, you could do some relaxation exercises before uh, the motor imagery intervention to uh, get um, to to provide a better concentration during the motor imagery. So my conclusion: um, a motor imagery training of two weeks seems to have no effect on the throwing ability uh, of the non-preferred arm in healthy people, um, but. Uh, there are some factors who can succeed the motor imagery intervention. So choose a, a, a trained and a simple skill and make sure your participants are able or your patients are able to stay concentrated or make use of uh, relaxation exercises. So at this point, I don't think I, I will use it in cl clinical practice uh, because I think, uh, because I doubt about the practicability and I, uh, I think there needs to be a better guideline for the use of motor imagery. Um, and I'm, uh, it would be interesting to do research after the uh, effect of motor imagery on the orthopedic rehabilitation and on a wider um, target group. So maybe in uh, the future we're all going to use it, but, but for now I think it's too early. So thank you for, my, uh, for your interest. That was my presentation.